Amen. <laughs> How many Pentecostals we have in here? <laughs> well, you know the way I look at it, Pastor, we don't have Sunday night service. So, hey, we can, we can do a double time on Sunday morning. Amen? <laughs> Will you give me a few extra minutes this morning? Because I, I believe the Lord's got something to say. Amen. Amen. Once again, I'm privileged and humbled to be here to, to preach, and especially when this church is so blessed with a bullpen of preachers over there just chomping at the bit, waiting their turn, you know. <laughs> pastor, says, pastor says, you're up, and man, they're out to the gate like a racehorse with a triple crown. <laughs> but that's the way it ought to be. That's the way it ought to be. <laughs> Amen. But it's an humbling experience, and I'm deeply blessed to, to be a part of it. Uh, I, I was so cautious and timid when we first started coming here that it took me a long time to feel free to come down and pray for those that had come to the altar because I, I didn't want to be misunderstood in my motives or motivation. Or, you know, and, and I, it was real cautious for me to do that because, you see, I feel I am very privileged. This, this office of being ordained being God called to preach this gospel means something to me. It's special. It's holy. And I don't ever want the devil to get the idea that I would trade what I have for anything that he's got. That brings me to the, that brings me to the title of my message, Not for Sale. Amen? How many is tired of the, just being used by the devil as a punching bag? Getting tired of being his floor mat. It's time to, it's time to kick him right between the seat pockets. Amen. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Kings 21, verse 1. Verse 1. 1 Kings 21, verse 1. Say amen when you get there. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel next to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it is near next to my house, for I will give you a vineyard better than it. Or if it seems good to you, I'll give you its worth in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. Remember that line. So Ahab went into his house sullen and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoke to him, because he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And Ahab lay down on his bed and turned his face and would not eat. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for the opportunity to break the bread of life, your word. And Lord, I ask this morning that you would enable me. Lord, that you'd give me that anointing that only you can provide, that your words are what is heard, not mine. Lord, let them see you, not me. And Lord, this message goes forth in the mighty name of Jesus. And we bind all powers of darkness. And Satan, get your hands off of God's people this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you ever been to a garage sale or any kind of sale for that matter? And you spotted something that, oh, man, you've been looking for that forever. You know, and you, <laughs> your mouth kind of waters, you creep up to it, you know, and you almost get your hands onto it only to hear, that's not for sale. Been there, done that? Yeah. <laughs> Our scripture passage here also introduces us to a man who refused to sell. A man named Naboth, whose, whose name means fruit. And he lived in Jezreel. Naboth owned a vineyard that was situated right beside the summer palace of the king, and uh, who was the king of Israel at that time. And Ahab wanted that vineyard really bad, really bad. He wanted enough that he was even willing to pay him extra cash, uh, give him a better vineyard than what he had had. He wanted that thing really bad. Uh, Naboth flatly refused the king's offer. Now, to you and I, probably, just on the surface, somebody offer us twice what something's worth, we'd say, yeah, hey, you know, write that check out. Let's get it done. But Naboth had a reason. Naboth flatly refused the king's offer, which makes the whole thing very ironic because 
King Ahab didn't know what he was up against. He's the king. You know, kings are used to getting their way. They're used to kind of being spoiled. They're used to getting their way. But he didn't know what he was up against when he went for Naboth's vineyard. When I used to be in martial arts, yeah, I did that. There was a time, believe it or not, that I could kick your hat off your head without you even being able to stop it. Now I can't even get my shoes up high enough to tie my shoes, you know. <laughs> I've, got, I've got trophies for breaking boards and bricks with my hands, you know. And now I have trouble breaking into a box of Cheerios. <laughs> but, but anyway, my point is this. that when we, when we were required to fight in tournaments, they'd train us by saying that if you know yourself and your opponent, you'll do exceedingly well. But if you only know yourself and not your opponent, then your chances of winning are diminished. But if you know neither yourself nor your opponent, you are gravely ill-prepared. And that was Ahab's problem. He didn't know himself. He was just a spoiled little rich kid who knew everything in the world except what he ought to have known. And he was up against something greater and mightier than he was. So let's look at the reason why Nabal said no. There are some in our world today, in case you haven't noticed, if you don't watch the news or debates or anything like that, there are some in our world today that would be willing and ready to take away what we have been sovereignly given by the Lord. We live, as a Christians, probably the most dangerous times that history has portrayed in the last 2,000 years. I think it's important and needful that we as, as Christians understand that sometimes it's important to draw a line in the sand. We need to stand firm in what we believe. When the world comes to us with these enticing plans and new fads and ideas, saying to us as Satan did in the Garden of Eden, Eden remember when he said to Eve, did God really say that? Hath God said? Well, the world will, will breed in you Seeds of doubt and confusion. And we need to be able to stand up and say, just as Naboth did, it's not for sale. It's not for sale. Some things in life need to mean enough to you that you're willing to draw a line in the sand and say, no matter what, that's it. No matter what, I'm standing my ground. It's not for sale. So first of all, Naboth refused because of the word of God. The king's request seemed to be reasonable, seemed to be pretty fair. But how many know that Satan always makes his offers seem reasonable? They seem fair. Seems like a pretty good deal. You ever heard some, some promises from people, and I won't mention any names, that sound too good to be true? You sit back and you think, well, they're going to do this, they're going to do that, they're going to do something else. Gonna, how in the world are they going to do it? I haven't heard yet how they're going to do it, but anyway, I said I wouldn't say anything. <laughs> he said, give me your field and I'll give you a better one in return. And I'll pay you whatever you want in cash. Sure, it sounds good, but Naboth's refusal was based on the grounds that God had already said in his word. That he could not sell the land. God said exactly that in the law of Moses in Leviticus 25, 23 through 28. In fact, the word of God was very clear that even the king could not buy the land because it was an inheritance. It was given to them by God and they understood that and realized that. King Ahab, not being too swift on morals, didn't seem to think that was too important. But Naboth fully realized what he possessed. And it wasn't his to sell. What he possessed was the gift of God. And he was only a, merely a caretaker. Church, if we could just learn a little bit of that lesson today, I think we'd be a lot stronger and a little further ahead. What we have been given, what God has blessed us with, we're caretakers, we're keepers. The grace, the glory, and the splendor of this great salvation that we enjoy didn't come from us. It's not something you could go out and earn or buy or steal. It came from God. It came through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's just simply not for sale. And here, according to God's law, Naboth was to keep the land in the family so he could pass it down to the next generation. 
But I think sometimes it'd be a good idea for us as Christians to take inventory of the great and wonderful and good gifts that God has bestowed upon us. The church, the Bible, His Word, the plan of salvation, our worship, our biblical standards, our godly heritage, all ought to mean something to us and not be taken for granted. We ought to be thanking God every day for what He has done for us, that we have become a new creature, a creation in Him. We are free. We are free. We are free in Christ. We need to remember that these things aren't ours to do with as we please. We're custodians. It's important that we nurture and cultivate that which we have, that we can pass it on to the next generation. I personally believe, like the pastor, that the Lord's coming soon. But if not, what in the world are we going to hand down to the next generation? What kind of church is the next generation going to be? Who are they going to turn to? We see so much of the churches in the world today that are going toward philosophy and psychology. Instead of going to a prayer closet and praying through and getting the answers that God would have, they send you to a psychologist, psychiatrist, who doesn't know the answer anyway. You know, what they say, i, I just doing this offhanded because I didn't check the statistics, but they used to say that there are more suicides among psychiatrists than any other profession that there is. And they're going to send us to them for answers? Huh? We have to, we have what we have because someone cared enough to lay their lives on the line and say, devil, you ain't getting this. You're not going to pass that law. You're not going to tread on God's kingdom. You're not going to destroy God's things, the holy things that God has given us. been handed down to us and we need to take care of it to hand it down to the next generation paul said in second timothy 2 2 and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses commit those to faithful men who will be able to teach others also we have to be faithful to do that number two naboth also refused to sell because of the will of the fathers it was integrity now there's a word you don't hear much of anymore it was integrity 2 Corinthians 2.17 says, For we are not, as so many are, peddling the Word of God, but we speak as from sincerity, as from God. We speak in the sight of God in Christ. Naboth's forefathers had passed down what he had in his inheritance. It meant something. It meant something. If he went ahead and sold the farm, he wouldn't have anything else to hand down to his generation. The next generation wouldn't have anything to hand down to their generation. It had been passed down from centuries. So the only thing he could do with character was to say to King Ahab, it's not for sale. Just like you and I, if we sell out our inheritance, that which God has given us, our heritage, which is this true and great and powerful gospel message, we'll have nothing to hand down to the next generation. We'll have nothing for them to build upon. We'll have nowhere for them to go for the answers. If we begin to compromise and water it down, if we lower our standards, if we lose our foundation of faith, then there's nothing left. There's nothing left. We become exactly as the Scripture says, a form of godliness. I mean, you can go to church all you want to go to church. But it doesn't make you powerful in Christ. It doesn't even make you a Christian. I could stand in a garage all day long. won't make me a car. So what we have been entrusted with as holy, as holy, we need to guard it, to hand it down. First thing that we need to protect is God's salvation plan. You know, there's a lot of people preaching a lot of different ways of salvation today. There's a seeker-sensitive contemporary version of, of a religion. And it says there are no absolutes anymore, that God doesn't expect us to do anything but be what we feel good about. Just tiptoe through the tulips, you know. 
The true gospel message has been so picked apart and watered down in a lame effort to not offend anybody and to fit in and be relevant that it's lost its fire. It's lost its power in most churches, and ironically, it has lost its relevancy at the same time. The true gospel message will always be an offense. Always. And it's God's truth, and ultimately will defeat Him. The gospel message in itself is designed to be confrontational. It's going to bring you to a decision. If, it doesn't, if the gospel message, when it's preached, doesn't bring you to some type of decision, whether it's salvation whether it's dedication, whether it's holiness, whether it's sanctification, then it is not doing its job. If a person comes to church, hears a gospel message, goes out the door and... What was that about? Gosh, I don't remember. Something's wrong. You need to find a church that gets some food on the table that will feed you the bread. They say, oh, there's... Many ways to, to God. Many ways to God. Many spokes to the same wheel. You've probably heard that. God only recognizes and sees one way. That's the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ. We have to be faithful daily to guard and defend that one true plan of salvation. By actively, knowledgeably proclaiming it in the world in which we live today. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. And in Jude, I love this. Jude 1.3, it says, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. And for all those people that don't want to offend anybody, don't want to get confrontational, Want to just tiptoe through their little experience and hope you, hope you get a little gospel rubs off of me, you know. That word contend is the same word used in a boxing match. It is an earnest contention. It is a fight. It is a battle to stand up for the word of God. He says, if it is I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly. Get in this fight. You're a soldier. Let's do it. Amen? Amen? I am so sick and tired of hearing how this politician group and that group and some of has passed some law that is totally, and you're thinking, where was the church? Where was the Christians? Why didn't they vote? How do these guys get by with this stuff? Honey, let me tell you something. We have a president that said he's got a phone and a pen, and he's not afraid to use it. We as Christians need to take that same attitude. You've got a phone, you've got a pen, and you've got prayer. Use it. Use it. Use it. It's not for sale, church. It's not for sale. The scripture is under attack. Many are just plainly denying that the word of God is even the word of God anymore. But the Bible is still God's word, his revelation to mankind. It's the only written revelation of God to, to man. It's still powerful. It's still truth. It's still inerrant. It's still infallible. It's still inspired. Modern versions like the, the message. Now, I don't know. I'm not picking on anybody in particular. If you happen to have one, I'm sorry. Other contemporary paraphrases like it aren't any Bible at all. You can't get enough gospel out of the message to get saved. And if you did, you wouldn't know what to do after you got saved. The most accurate version that you can still use is the King James Version because it's a word-for-word -word translation. You know that the Holy Spirit, when he dictated the words to, to writing down the gospels and the Bible, did it word-for-word? -word? Every word in that Bible in the original meant something very special. I like the King James for two reasons. Because one, because of that word translate word for word translation. And the other is, is kind of a neat little trick that my, my brother in law is a has a PhD in biblical Greek, so and he said in the King James Version, anytime you see a verb that ends with E T H believeth, for example, 
That verb is an ongoing action word. It's not something just happened once and that it was over with. It's ongoing action. So like Brother Borg preached last week when he did the message, for everyone that asketh, receive it. Everyone that keeps on asking will continue to receive. And he that seeketh, find it. He that keeps looking is going to find it and keep on finding it. And him that knocketh, it shall be open. That applies also to the word receiveth, believeth, hmm? walketh, sinneth, loveth, continueth love, continueth believing, continue receiving, continued action. Now, I know that there are some other great examples of translations like the New American Standard, Young's Literal Translation, a few others. But you need to be careful of what you're putting in your mind. You can be totally misled by what you read. When they try to take away your Bible and they try to change the timeless truth of what God has given us, just look them right square in the eye and say, it's not for sale. I'm going to hang on to what I've got. And then there's the doctrine of, salvation, of separation. Most churches now are in the business of lowering the walls of separation between Christians and the world. You know, uh, to win them, we've got to be more like them. We've got some 50, 60-year-old youth minister. He's got his hair all spiked up, and he's got his jumping out of his jeans. All, and he looks ridiculous. He's making a fool of himself, and he doesn't even know it. Honey, it's not your spiked hair. It's not your tore-up blue jeans. It's not the rock music that you play. It's not the language that you use and act like you're being cool like some young kid, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know what gets people saved? It's still the Word of God. It is still the Word of God. It is still the Word of God. They want us to make people feel comfortable, not under any conviction. One preacher says it this way, it's the doctrine of feeling good without being good. And it's the truth. But the main problem we have is, is twofold. Because only the preaching of the Word of God can save people. We... They think that, well, you know, I've got to dress like the young guys. No, you don't. Well, we've got to play this rock music in church. No, you don't. Well, we've got to get these fog machines and all these new lights and stuff. No, you don't. It's the gospel that gets people saved. It's the gospel preached under the anointing of the Holy Spirit that will touch and change lives, set the sinner free. It's got nothing to do with you. You ought to be just be a good vessel. Amen. First of all, and this may be a bitter pill to swallow for some people with a big ego, but we in ourselves can't save the lost. That's his job. That's God's job. Through the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, we just have to be obedient to his word and be willing to be a vessel that he can flow through through the anointing, that the Holy Spirit might use us to reach that person, to be able to, to share this gospel with whoever and wherever we go, whoever it is. It's not about us. In fact, most of the time, if we get ourselves out of the way, things go a lot smoother. But they've got to know the truth, even if it makes them uncomfortable. Even if it makes them uncomfortable. Second, we're commanded to be separate from the world. Second Corinthians 6, 17 says, Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch that which is unclean and I will receive you. The word separate means to mark oneself off from others by boundaries. It's a picture of building walls between the world and the church. We need those walls to separate us from what's going on out there. I mean, I know, don't misunderstand me. I know we've got to live in this world. We've got to be in this world. We've got jobs. We've got family. We've got friends. We've, we are a part of this world. But we don't have to be a part of that world. I don't know about you, but I can't, I wish I had a dollar for every time that my wife and I have had to draw the line and say, you know, I can't be around those people with that language. 
I can't go to those places that they want to go. That we have to draw the line whether, whether they like it or not. Whether it makes you all popular, I don't care. If you're worried about being popular, you're in the wrong place anyway. <laughs> but you have to draw the line sometime and say, that's it. It's not for sale. It's not because we're better in the world. It's not because that trying to act all stuffed shirt. It's because we are saved. I don't want to be a part of that anymore. I've seen the tears. I've seen the pain. I've seen the, the problems that are caused. I don't want to be a part of that anymore. I'm free in Christ this morning. I'm free. I don't have to carry around that guilt. I don't have to worry about that sin. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. Love the sinner, but hate the sin. We have to guard our separation this morning. And it's not a suggestion. It's a command. It's a command. Our big problem today is we don't have any boundaries. We don't want any boundaries. Hey, you know, I'm a I'm free dude, man. You know, I'm, you know, I'm right next to John Wayne. Whew. Duh. We don't earn salvation by what we do. I mean, I could, I could stand up here and say, well, you know, we got up at break of dawn this morning and walked four miles on our knees to prove that we was really dedicated about coming to church. In fact, we thought about walking to church, but the wind was too strong. And I, you know, we couldn't make it. It's not about that. What you do doesn't make you holy. But you have to have standards, spiritual standards, that you can say, this is, this is my course. It's set, and I'm not changing. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. It's not for sale. Praise. Thank God I can say it again. We've got the best praise and worship team there is in anywhere. Amen. I... <laughs> I... I must say this. They may get a big head, but I'm going to say it anyway. My wife and I was uh, listening to uh, a certain satellite station the other day, and, and uh, I said, made mention then, I said, you know, I'd rather listen to our people sing than to any of those that's on this, you know. I, I enjoy it. They bless me more. They, it just, they just have the heart of God in our praise. We've been, as a church and as a as Christians, we've been given a rich heritage in what God has given us for praise. Used to be in the old days, they'd have a, what they used to call go to meeting. Everybody would come to the church, they'd have church services, and then that wasn't enough. They'd go out and have dinner on the ground, and have a singing in the afternoon. They'd spend the day with the Lord. Now most people, by the time if you're not out of church by 12 up noon, they'd walk out on you. Got that roast in the oven, Pastor, you know. Well, okay. <laughs> you know, most of our churches nowadays are so engulfed in silence that there's nothing there. I mean, it's like a refrigerator church. They've lost the pure joy of the Lord. That's got to be a sad, sad state. There are some, there are some funerals that are livelier than some of the church. <laughs> We, we had a sweet, sweet, dear black lady that went to our church, and, and uh, she passed on, and, and the family wanted me to do the funeral. So I came up here to Wichita, and, and I'd never done a funeral for black families, and got there, and the place was packed out. And I don't know, I, I was kind of scared. I thought, well, I only know how to preach one way, and I hope they don't take it wrong, you know. If they're expecting somebody to come in and say, our Father, which you already in heaven, you know. Just ain't going to be me, honey. I just don't go that route. But we got in there, and, and I got to preaching. And honey, we had church. 
That wasn't a funeral. That was a celebration. That was a graduation. But that's the way it ought to be. Amen. Honey, I'd rather, I'd rather, if I got to preach a funeral, that's the way I want to go. Man. So don't ask me to preach a funeral unless you're expecting something. Because I, I just can't go that dead old cold, dry, nothing. Mm. Oh, don't get me started. <laughs> But not enough people these days are giving God the praise and the worship that he deserves and demands. When you get a really good look at what God has brought you out of, when you look back and see the changes that he has made in your life, when you get a glimpse of the glory that he has in store for you and I, honey, you're going to want to shout. You're going to want to get a little loud. You're going to want to sing and clap. Why? Because you've got something to be happy about. You've got something to shout about. You've got something you want the world to know about. Somebody ought to shout a little bit. Somebody ought to get a little happy in here this morning. Amen. Has the Lord set you free this morning? Has the Lord delivered you this morning? Has he taken those sins away? Has he taken away that guilt? Has he taken away that burden that you've been carrying around for so long? Hmm. Praise Him. Never be afraid to praise Him. Never be afraid of what, what your neighbor's thinking, what your family's thinking, what somebody across the church is thinking. It don't matter. Honey, God will bless you regardless of what they're doing. <laughs> Amen. Has He healed your body? Has He healed your mind? Has He set you on a solid rock? Has He given you new direction, a new motive? Time to shout a little bit. We need to begin to guard our Pentecostal heritage of being loud and boisterous and excited in our praise by actually doing it. Amen. Doesn't matter how much you talk about it. If you're not doing it, it don't mean anything. <laughs> when they try to entice you and tell you to tone it down a little bit, well, now you're just getting a little too loud and excited there. You need to get it under control just a little bit now. Just smile and say, honey, it's not for sale. It's not for sale. It's not for sale. Amen. Amen. Leadership. We've been so saturated in this last decade over an overemphasis of what they call leadership now instead of ministry. We don't have pastors anymore. It's leaders. We have leadership books, leadership seminars, leadership videos, leadership coffee cups, leadership bumper stickers, T-shirts. Blah, 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 blah. The church has become so conditioned to believe that if we can just get the right kind of higher educated, more corporately experienced leader, that we're going to make it. We'll be fine. We're going to have a mega church. We'll be rich and famous. Everybody will want to come. Everybody will want to. But that's only one more example of the flesh in secular thinking. Corporate ideas being brought into the church by people like C. Porter Wagner and Rick Warren. It's using materialistic ideas to try to guide a spiritual entity. And it will not work. It's like mixing oil with water. And you can't mix the world and the Holy Spirit. It'll never work. It's using materialistic ideas to try to guide a spiritual entity. What we really need more than anything else than for somebody just to stand in the office of a leader is old-fashioned pastors, preachers who are God-called, God-empowered. We need men and women of God that will fall on their faces before the King of kings and the Lord of lords and seek Him for what He wants us to do. Seek His will, His guidance, His direction, His leadership, and not be afraid to hang on to the altars till God breaks through. We need men and women who will hear from God and then stand up boldly and declare, Thus saith the Lord. It wasn't some book that I read. It wasn't from some seminar that I went to. It wasn't from some well-meaning individual that thought they knew it all. I got it from God. I got it from God. We don't need more women, men and women that have just returned from a John Maxwell leadership seminar. We just need more men and women that have just come back from a corporate-based leadership seminar. I don't understand how in the world after a lifetime 
of depending on God, how some of these denominations, fellowships, are turning their back on the Spirit of God and saying, well, I can go to school and get more than that. If I've got a doctorate, if I've got a Ph.D., if I've got some kind of big celebrity award, that'll mean more. No, we still need to depend on God. It's not based on some ten easy steps to building your mega church. What we really need more than anything else in the world is more men and women that will come back as Moses did when he came down from the mountain with the Shekinah glory on his face because he had been with God. Not because of some seminar, not because of man, not because of the flesh, but because he had been with God. Hmm. We need men and women of the church that have a vision in their eyes and fire in their bones for what God can and will do. God can and will do anything that he has ever done in the past. I get so sick and tired of people saying, oh, that was back then, that was... Things are different now, you know, Pastor. No, it's not. I serve the God that's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. I, we need an old-fashioned hunger for a powerful Holy Spirit move in our lives once again. We need people young and old with a contrite and broken heart that are hungry for lost souls, tired of being the devil's punching bag, tired of being defeated, that are willing to stand up in the power of God, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and move once again. We need a deep hunger for God as we've never had before, church. Say, Lord, touch me one more time. Touch me one more time. Move me once again. Lord, speak direction and meaning into my life. You and I have been given a precious inheritance. Our forefathers gave us an inheritance of holiness, praise, and spiritual awakening, spiritual power. Church, this thing is holy. This thing is holy. This thing is holy. And I'm tired of seeing it defiled by man's decisions, man's works, the flesh. I read an article from the head of a certain denomination that said what our leaders need more than anything is to get in touch with our inner selves. If you want the power, you need to get in touch with your inner self. Church, we have got in touch with the inner self in the flesh so much that we stink. We stink of the flesh. When God wants to pour His holiness, His Spirit out upon us, and we stink of the flesh. Naboth refused to sell because of his lack of worthiness of the king. Church, the world isn't worthy of what we have. You're not worthy to buy at any price that which I have received by inheritance. He said it's not for sale. Those who would attempt to take what we have are not worthy of our inheritance. We can't give so much as an inch. There's nothing going to be left if we keep giving and giving and giving and giving. What we have is worth more than pleasing the world. It's worth more than the flesh or the devil. It's worth more than fitting in and being popular. I know that's hard to do in this day and age, especially for the young people. But God has something better in store for you. What you get from God, you can't buy, beg, borrow, or steal anywhere else. What we have is worth more. Revelation 3.18 says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire that you may be rich with white garments, that you may be clothed and the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Nothing else should matter but pleasing the Lord. Nothing else matters. When the old devil comes around peddling his lies and saying he's got something better, just tell him, devil, it's not for sale. It's not for sale. Paul Harvey used to say, and now the rest of the story. <laughs> Ahab, like the adolescent he was, went home to Jezebel and pouted. Jezebel was a fixer. So she plotted to get rid of Naboth. 
Naboth died, but God prevailed. <laughs> Chapter 21, verse 16, it says, So it was when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, and Ahab got up and went down to take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Thank God that he has always had a man. God has always had a man. Somewhere, somehow, God has always had a man. Elijah wasn't a stranger to Ahab. They had met before on Mount Carmel. When Elijah, God through Elijah, defeated the prophets of Baal. So he knew he was in trouble when Elijah came to see him. He knew he was in trouble. And the pronouncement of God of judgment was on, on his life. Naboth paid a great price, but he firmly stood his ground so that his inheritance was passed on to the next generation. Church, we have to keenly understand that what the next generation will have tomorrow is determined by the decisions that we make today. Your actions, your decisions have consequences. It's up to us to be sure that that legacy is handed down concerning the true and complete gospel of Jesus Christ. This message of the cross is important. The church here in America is seemingly stalled out. In China, it's growing. In India, it's growing. In Africa, it's growing. In South America, it's growing. But here in America, we have sold out to a cheap copy of the gospel that's easy, comfortable, and sugar-coated. We need to get back to being a church that has some backbone, some direction, some purpose, instead of just trying to entertain the masses. We need to be the heavyweight contenders that Jude talked about. If I could get the singers and musicians to come back. A few years ago, Michael Combs wrote a song called Not For Sale. He said, what happened to that preacher? He used to preach so strong. What happened to that singer? He used to sing that song. The preacher's out selling Amway. That singer is now singing country. They sold out what was right for what is wrong. What happened to that church we used to be so on fire? What happened to all the voices that used to sing in the choir? Oh, the church has now grown dead and cold. The choir is silent because nobody goes. They sold out to the world and their own desires. But this heart belongs to Jesus because he saved my soul from hell. This heart belongs to Jesus. This heart is not for sale. Amen. Church, when the world says it wants something more popular, more economic, uh, economical, when the church is ready to compromise its standards, ready to fit in with the world, when old Satan comes around and he tries to get you to back down, give up, sell out, look him straight in the eye and say, Devil, it's not for sale. It's not for sale. I've come too far to turn back now. That's why the message of the cross is so important. When Jesus shed his blood and he died for you and I, took our sins on Calvary, it sealed the deal for a new covenant. We are in Christ. We are in Christ. Brother Rodney probably didn't understand or realize fully when the, he made mention a couple of weeks ago when he preached about being tied up, tangled up, wrapped all up in Jesus. You know, that is the literal meaning of the Greek phrase, in Christ. Wrapped up, tangled up, tied all up in Jesus. Isn't that where you want to be this morning? That's where I want to be. That's what I want to be. God is still a covenant God. God is still the author and the finisher of our faith. God still knows how to uphold his people. God still knows how to kick the devil out of your way when he comes against you. It's our duty to stand our ground and say, Satan, you talk a good talk. You sure make things look glittery and bright, but it's not for Satan. I've come too far to turn back now. My God has brought me a mighty long way. Devil, it's not for sale.
When the old devil comes around peddling you that rotten message, another gospel, another Jesus, tell him it's not for sale. It's not for sale. How many real warriors are in this house this morning? How many do I see? How many does God see that are willing to stand up and say, I'm ready to fight. I will draw the line in the sand. Stand up. How many neighbors do we have here this morning? Let me see your hand. People that will say it's not for sale at any price. What God has given me is too important. It's too holy. It's too important. It's not for sale. Church, I feel strongly about this. We have cheapened this gospel. We have cheapened this gift that God has given us. And we think that by doing what the world likes and enjoys, that we can make it better. God is looking for holy people. God is looking for people that will walk the line. God is looking for people that will put Him first this morning. It doesn't matter what the world says. It doesn't matter what the world does. The only thing that matters this morning is how do you stand with God? Are you willing to say no to the world? Are you willing to say no to the devil? No matter how good it looks. No matter what kind of vineyard he offers you. No matter what kind of a check that he's ready to write you out. Are you willing to draw the line and say, Satan, it's not for sale. It's not for sale. If that's you this morning, just lift your hands right now. I want to hear praise. I want to hear worship. I want to hear, a, I want to hear a congregation that is committed to say, I've had enough of the world. I've had enough of the devil. I've had enough of the offers. I want to go on with my Lord. I want to go on with my Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Church, there are some things that are important enough to actually die for. There are some things in life that is important enough to draw the line and stand there and say, that's enough. I draw the line. Come what may, good, bad, or ugly, I'm going on with my Lord. I'm going on with my Lord. I'm going on with my Lord, and devil, it's not for sale. Hallelujah. Just praise Him this morning. Just praise Him this morning. As they sing, just praise Him, Lord. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've given us. Lord, help us never to take for granted the treasures that we have in this earthen vessel. Lord, help us this morning to realize the greatness and the glory that you have waiting for us. Lord, what you have offered us, what you have promised us is beyond anything that the world can comprehend. Lord, we praise you this morning. We glorify you. Lord, we lead you this morning. Empower us as a church. Lord, enable us as individuals. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah.